All right, well, we're gonna jump into week two of our series, Mind Your Business, the thing that you've been wanting to tell your neighbor for a long time. Hey, just mind your business. You do you and I'll do me. And we are looking at this phrase and saying, is there anything redemptive in it? And is there a mindset in a way that God wants us to think about our careers, our occupations, and our work? And what we established in week one is work is not simply limited to things you are compensated for. Some of you work within the home or some of you, you're a full-time student and that takes a lot of work even though you don't receive a paycheck. But it's saying in the spaces in which we occupy, uh, is there a way in which God wants us to steward our efforts and our talents to glorify him, to make a difference and to advance our lives aligning with his purpose? How does God want us to mind our business? And today's conversation, I would say, is in many ways a response to a lot of conversations that I have with professionals and students and parents of students, individuals who are working, uh, and I find myself constantly receiving emails and people reaching out wanting to have a conversation about what we're gonna talk about today. And I'll give you two examples. Uh, one, I recently got to speak at this leadership event, and I was talking about the three things that I think separate an individual in leadership. The three things that really over time uh, are the byproduct or the cause and effect to an individual's rise in leadership. And, and those three things, in my opinion, are pace, pressure, and pain. I think a lot of times in leadership, most of us are managing many of the same dynamics. Have you ever found that it's a lot of the same things that we're bumping into, relational things, we're, we're spotting problems and we're solving problems. And a lot of times we can complain about our problems, but folks, here's the deal. Where there is no problem, there's no need for a leader. So you might wanna put some gratitude on your problems because it is your problems that oftentimes give you job security. And it's learning to steward your time and your efforts in a way that manages well the things that are on your plate. And a lot of times, the thing that will separate you over time in your career is can you manage what you're managing uh, at a greater pace with greater pay, uh, pressure facing greater pain? And a lot of times, those three dynamics separate leaders as they ascend in different roles of leadership. And at the end of this talk, I spent a, a great deal on the pain conversation. That endurance is critical if you're gonna live a life of leadership. In fact, I think we rise uh, in leadership to the threshold of our pain. And those who endure the most get down the road and they enjoy the most. I think sometimes we get it wrong in the faith conversation where we're in such a hurry, we think the goal is to see who can go the fastest. When in all reality, the goal is who can go the farthest? Who can stick with it? who can stay to the course, who can remain faithful, and who can walk that long obedience in the same direction, honoring God day after day, day after day, enduring come what may. And I get done with this talk, I stay to hear the other speaker, and afterwards, the individual who spoke after me, he said, hey, can I have, uh, talk to you for a second? And I, I don't wanna dishonor him, so I won't say his name, and I won't share the company he's a part of, but the individual is a CFO of a Fortune 500 company here in the country. And he said, hey, would you ever consider uh, being a private pastor uh, for a small group of high-profile leaders within the country? And I never had a question asked to me like that. You know, much of my ministry journey has been marked with surprise. If you are surprised to see me up here, just join the club, I'm just as surprised as you are. A, a lot of times when an opportunity comes, it, it takes me by surprise. And I, I said, you know, I don't even know what that means you would probably have to define the target for me to tell you whether or not I could even add value to what you're talking about. And he said, well, there's a group, a network of us, we're all within the C-suite of Fortune 500 companies, and we're all believers, and we are all navigating challenges within our workspace. He says, one of my good friends, who again leads a company that every single one of you would immediately know the brand and name, is the CEO of the company. And he said he was recently pulled in by the board and the stakeholders. And what was brought to the board's attention is somebody submitted to the board, hey, you should know our CEO attends this church and on this church's website is this statement. And what they had was the church's statement on marriage. 
And this church embraced a very traditional biblical view of marriage that it's a lifelong monogamous relationship between a man and a, a woman. And the board informs the CEO, they said, you know, uh, we are aiming to be known and marked by these new set of values. And we wanna be this type of organization. And looking at the church you attend, uh, we are in doubt as to whether or not as a CEO, you are in alignment with us and you can lead us as an organization. And so now he's under a year review just because he goes to a church that has a Christian stance on marriage. And he says, so our group has been talking and we're, we're starting to consider maybe uh, because we now live in times where we can literally be canceled just by the church we attend, what would it look like if we, we stopped attending our churches and we just hired out a pastor to, to pastor us privately? To which I said, you know, I, I'm flattered. Uh, I still don't know if I could add the value you would be looking for, but I do think if I were to say yes, I would be letting you down and kind of reinforcing the wrong idea. I said, you have to understand that whenever there is an agenda, it is always going to be targeted at the leaders. And you gentlemen and women in those spaces, uh, you carry a leadership burden. But here's the thing, if you throw in the towel and you don't hold the line and you just give up, well, that pressure then falls to the next level of leadership within our country. And guess what? It's just gonna create a snowball effect where those at the top start throwing in the towel and everyone follows suit behind them. You need to take courage and, and toe the line. And... I just said, you know, you have to understand that we now live in times where we still have religious freedoms and we have religious rights. And though those things hang in the balance and are tampered with daily, uh, we still have those things in place uh, that you would do yourself a favor and you would do the community of faith at large a favor if you just stayed faithful and, and stayed to the course. And there was that one conversation. Simultaneously, that month, there was another conversation. A lady reached out and she said, hey, I have this strange dynamic and I, I would be curious what your thoughts are. She said, I, I have a son in college and she said, my kids, I have always proofread all their essays, all their research papers. Uh, I'm really good at grammar and so I tend to edit their papers. Which anyone thankful for someone who's good at grammar? Oh my goodness, I'm so thankful for these people. I'm terrible at grammar. It doesn't matter how educated I become. There are certain things I'm just always gonna say it a certain way. It is like hardwired in my head. I've got a little bit of hood and redneck in me that's going to always come out. So it may be more appropriate to say more fun, but I'm gonna always say funner. Anyone else? It's just a funner experience. And I appreciate people who are good at grammar. This woman's good at grammar. And she said, my son the other day sent me a paper. But before he did so, he called me and said, Mom, I gotta give you a heads up. I'm sending you a paper. And I want you to know in advance, I don't believe any of this. The things I'm arguing and writing, I completely disagree with. But what I've learned in this class is this is what you have to write in order to get the grade with this professor. So don't be concerned as to where I'm at. I'm just trying to hit the mark for my class. And so this Mom was asking me, what, what do you do in a scenario like that? And I could belabor the point. I could talk about every single week the amount of emails that come in for individuals trying to figure out how do I live a life for Christ in a marketplace or in an educational environment that runs against the grain and is constantly combating and resisting the things I believe. And it would seem strange to talk about such a thing and a series on work, but this is probably the top three conversation that I find myself in as a pastor. How do you do it? If you grew up in the 90s, I mean, we grew up saying, hey, you can talk the talk, but can you walk the walk? Come on, wave at me if you ever said that growing up. Yeah. Well, now we live in such tumultuous times where that has been flip-flopped to some degree. I find that individuals can walk the walk, hey, I can live a life of integrity and purity and, and I can be faithful to God's word in my life and, and I can be a grateful person and a charitable person. I can be generous and, and forgiving. Uh, I can walk it, but I don't know how to talk the talk anymore. The, the conversation at large has shifted so much, I feel like every single day I'm on a tightrope tiptoeing landmines. And the question is, is how do we do it 
in a way that honors God and in some way enhances our witness to those who don't believe what we believe. And we're gonna talk about some things today and just know this. You're gonna think to yourself, well, that's, that's easy for you to say. You're a pastor. You get to work in this environment. You have no idea what it's like for us out there. And, and I would say you're, you're probably right. But I would tell you the same thing I told a group of pastors the other day. There's this study going on about all these pastors who are quit, quitting the ministry and going into the marketplace. Less pressure, better pay, go into the marketplace. And I said, just be careful whenever you envy someone else's gig. We all have issues. One issue for me is most of you spend Monday through Friday being indoctrinated by nonsense and then only attend church once or twice a month and I've gotta combat it all. So we all got problems. Can I get an amen? But it's learning to say, God, okay, what, what do you have in mind? And what's amazing is, is scripture is so relevant. You open up the pages of scripture, you will find that you're not the first to go through something like this. We're not the first group of people uh, to face this. In scripture, there is actually a very impressive organizational leader who had a remarkable career, started young, stayed with the company for his entire life and grew in leadership and responsibilities and authority, and there's a lot we can learn from him. And his name is Daniel. Daniel is one of the great Old Testament prophets. In fact, there are some things that Daniel uh, prophesied through the, the words that God had instilled within him that came with impeccable and astonishing accuracy and clarity. I mean, he predicted and foretold the rise of the four great em empires, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, and the Romans. He even predicted their fate, as well as the arrival of Christ almost to the exact time. I mean, there's some things in Daniel's uh, book that are impressive. But what you need to know is the context of Daniel's story. Daniel is living in a time where the people of God are struggling. You ever looked around and thought the people of God are struggling? Here's what happens. There is this tendency, and you and I will be exposed of it as well if we're not careful, where whenever things are going well, we get laxed. Or maybe we take on an unnecessary arrogance that weans our dependency off of God and we develop an unhealthy confidence in ourselves. I think for the American church, prosperity is a much bigger issue than persecution. This won't be the first time that the people of God face pressure, but people have a hard time staying dependent and operating with faith when things are going well. And that's the story of the nation of Israel. They ebb and they flow. And what happens is eventually they divide because when you have a culture and society made up of selfish people, everyone fights for their own agendas and it splinters the society. So the people of God are split into two regions. There's the north, still known as Israel, and then there's the southern region known as Judah. And what happens is, is the north region, well, they fall prey to an opposing empire. And so they are squandered and plummeted. And what is so sad is the southern region doesn't pay attention. So there's a group of people who start to operate outside the will of God. They give themselves over to worldly things. They take on a vulnerability and a, a lack of stability. And then they topple and their weakness gets exposed. And the southern uh, region doesn't pay attention. I think we can be found guilty of the same thing. There's a lot of foolishness around us that we're not taking notes on. And you would do yourself a service to pay attention to the marriages around you and how they're raising children and the decisions people are making in their careers and how they steward certain things because you'll see a lot of bad examples and what not to do. Have you ever found that sometimes the best teachers are the worst teachers? They didn't tell me a lot of what to do, but my goodness, did they give me a lot of material as to what not to do. The southern region doesn't pay attention. They're splitting up into tribes, and here comes the Babylonians. And the Babylonians is this growing empire, and they come in and they besiege the entire place. And they take captive a remnant of the, the nation of Israel, Judah, at the time led by King Nebuchadnezzar with this elaborate strategy to infuse the Babylonian ideals and customs uh, into the people of God. In Daniel chapter one, it tells us this after they had besieged the area. It says, then the king ordered Ashpenaz, which just know uh, there's a lot of gnarly names in this text. And if you're pregnant, looking for a name still, there's a lot of options here. 
the chief of his court officials to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility. Young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed and quick to understand. Which all my single ladies, can I get an amen? Where are those guys at, right? And qualified to serve in the king's palace. And he was to teach them the language and literature. Do you find that you operate in a space where they're teaching you new language and new literature? He was assigned to teach them a new language and literature of the Babylonians. And the king assigned them daily an amount of food and wine from the king's table. And they were to be trained for three years. And after that, they were to enter the king's service. And among those who were chosen were some from Judah. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. These are four teenage boys. So if you're raising a teenage son, place them in this context. And the chief official gave them new names. To Daniel, the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. And I would say that much of what I'm saying, if I were to have accepted the invitation to go meet with these leaders and to sit at a retreat and say, hey, pastor this group, I would open up to the book of Daniel. And I would say, okay, what you're facing isn't new, and you can actually see it played out in chapter one of the book of Daniel. And you need to be mindful of these dynamics. Now, what you have to understand is what Daniel is going through. Guys, it is significantly worse than anything we're facing. I think one of the greatest mistakes you can make when reading the Bible is drawing too close of a parallel to the individuals in Scripture. It's easy to look at a person in Scripture and think, oh, yeah, me too. All right, you ever align with all the heroes? You know, so when it's the crucifixion, we all see ourselves as Jesus. It's like, nah, you're the one spitting on him. All right, you got the wrong character. But what happens is, is we, we at times align ourselves too closely and we don't see the gap between where we're at and the stature of the biblical heroes. And I think if you don't see the gap, you miss out on the opportunity uh, to understand where you can grow. I would say the gap, G-A-P, is oftentimes your growth action plan. And what happens is, is by drawing too close of a parallel, we miss it. I remember a time I walked into a space and there was this lady with a sprained ankle. And I said, oh man, what happened to your ankle? She's like, I sprained it. I was coming down the stairs the other day, twisted it. It was terrible. And then she said, I'm just a modern day Job out here suffering for Christ. To which I said, actually, you're not. Uh, Job had it a little worse. There is a chasm of a gap between what you're going through and what Job went through. There's a chasm of a gap between what we are going through and the pressure cooker that we would call the American society and what Daniel went through. Most would look at Daniel's situation and say, wow, that's a hopeless situation. It's a teenage kid. And there wasn't a lot to bank his confidence on. There was no revolt being organized. There was no leader on the outside organizing a remnant of people on a rescue mission. Hey, we're going in to save these kids who are now being held captive by this Babylonian empire. There was no coup being organized that they could hold out for. In addition to that, there was no integrity-filled judicial system or government policy that would review what happened to these kids and make right any injustice. So Daniel's in a situation as a 16, 17-year-old kid, and most would say he's hopeless. And I, I want you to think about the pressure he was under and how he still managed to honor God, gain influence, add value, in a way that maybe we can learn from. And there's three things that Daniel and the boys bump into. Three strategies of the opposition or the enemy that I find that we are bumping into every single day in our society. I think there is an agenda at large, but there are two primary environments where this is being scaled and baked into our society. And it is the marketplace and it is the education system. It's not to demonize either. It's just to say, if there's a mechanism that's scaling these efforts, those are two of the biggest pri uh, primary environments. And the first thing that you have to understand is there will be an attempt to rename me. 
So Daniel and the boys, they, they're taken captive and moments early on, they just arrived and what happens? They change their names. And folks, here's the question. Who gets the right to label anything? Who gets the right to label you? And in all reality, there's only two people who can label a thing. The manufacturer and the purchaser. If Nike made the shirt, they can put their logo on it. Adidas doesn't get to put their logo on it. They didn't make it. Nike made the shirt, put the logo on it. If you buy the shirt, well, you can put your kid's name on it because they're going to school with some Hellraisers who might steal it. Put your kid's name on it. You purchased it. Label that thing. Who can label something? Manufacturers and purchasers. Well, folks, who gets the right to label you? Your manufacturer, the one who knits you together in your mother's womb, who says you are fearfully and wonderfully made on purpose and for a purpose, who then arrived in the flesh and marched to Calvary's hill and paid the ultimate ransom for you and I. He is our manufacturer and our purchaser. No one gets to label you but the king of kings and your great maker. And a lot of times you won't understand what makes you great until you discover the greatness of your maker. Man, he's a great manufacturer. <laughs> and he was willing to pay the ultimate price for me. And they take these four boys and they give them names. And, you know, we live in times where we don't really think through the meaning of names and there's no judgment. I would find myself guilty of this as well. I named my oldest son Cannon. It doesn't really mean anything. If I had to assign meaning to it, it's like, hey, he's the big gun, the cannonball. Anywhere he goes, the kid's gonna make a big splash. That's all I've got. But it sounded cool, and he's CJ the third. And in biblical times, they would assign a whole meaning to a name. I mean, a sentence, a family story, a whole narrative. This name means this paragraph, right? And that was the case uh, for Daniel and the boys. So look at these names. Daniel's name is changed to Belteshazzar. Now watch how this happens. Daniel means God is my judge. In other words, God is righteous, God is holy, he establishes the standards, he maintains the standards, he's in control. God is my judge. And they changed his name to Belteshazzar, which means lady, protect the king. So Daniel steps into a space and they're like, okay, this guy is confident. His God is righteous, holy, and in full control. We need to change his gender and assign him to a lesser king, a king who needs to be protected, not a king who protects. Right, let's go to the next one. Hananiah, his name is changed to Shadrach. Now look at Hananiah means Yahweh has been gracious. Come on, all of our campuses, wave at me if God has been gracious to you. Have you discovered the mercy of God and the goodness of God? Yeah, he's been gracious. That you live long enough to discover he's so good and no matter where you go, goodness and mercy shall follow you all the days of your life, right? Well, they changed his name to Shadrach, which means I am fearful of God. So here this kid steps into a space, he's like, hey, God is good, and the culture says, no, no, no. Uh, you shouldn't trust them. You should fear them. And we live in a society and a culture that is peddling suspicion and the agenda will be, hey, in the same way you don't trust anybody, don't trust your God. And the agenda is pretty simple. They will attach satire to our faithfulness to portray it as foolishness, all to get you to be embarrassed and timid in your faith. And once the door cracks, they start to infuse suspicion. Don't trust God, he's not good. He's not for you. You should be afraid of him. And again, the change in label uh, is indicative of this. The next one, Michelle becomes Meshach. Now, Michelle means who can compare to my God, which is a question you should ask yourself often, a question maybe you should journal about. Michelle steps in and he's like, nobody can compare to my God. He is set apart. There are no other competitors. There are only false versions claiming to offer what my God can offer. No one can compare. Well, what do they change his name to? Meshach, which means I am despised, contemptible, and humiliated. Because again, if you lose confidence in your great maker, you'll lose confidence in the fact that maybe God made you to be great as well. And the moment you lose your reverence for God, you will lose your respect for yourself. And so suddenly his reverence is removed and humiliation 
is placed on him. And, and why do they do this? Because the moment you hijack someone's identity, you can manipulate their activity. Who you are determines what you do. And so anytime you're in a space where it recognizes, hey, we wanna get this group to follow suit and do what we want them to do, we need to change their identity so we can manipulate their activity. The last one, Azariah, his name is changed to Abednego. And Azariah means Yahweh has helped, which again, I could have every hand in the room raised as to the times where you discovered God was helpful. He's a provider, a protector. He's a wealth of wisdom. He is gentle and merciful, wonderful counsel, counselor, prince of peace. He's helped. And what do they change his name to? Abednego, which means the servant of Nebo. And so they take this guy and they're like, okay, he comes in with the identity of a son of the king. We need to reduce him to a slave of a man. And what's happening in our culture is individuals are trading in their sonship for slavery. Oh, that one never gets an amen. It's all right. Your job is to be open to the word. My job is to courageously teach it, and we'll figure it out together. But there is an agenda to rename. And you have to be careful as to the labels being placed on you that would dictate who you are and the purpose for your life. You see, what happens is, is over time, and pay attention to this, don't take my word for it, you're wise people. There will be an agenda to separate your convictions from your worship. Okay, so believe God is good, believe that he's for you, believe that Jesus died on a cross, that's your convictions. But let's separate your worship, and what is your worship? The things you adore, the things you esteem, the things that you are pursuing and gravitating to, the things that you lift up and exalt. And so what happens now is we operate in a space where it's like, okay, believe in God. But in this space, uh, we need you to lay down the worship of God. You can worship business, you can worship your kids' sports, you can worship entertainment, possession, and sex, but not God. And the conversation I had with the CFO, he made this statement. He said, in my company, uh, you can now be anything you wanna be but a Christian. And there will be this pressure to separate your convictions from your worship. And it's just learn to say, no, I work unto the Lord. And everything I do is to honor him, even remaining faithful in a high pressure situation. There will be an attempt to rename you. In addition to that, there will be a strategy to tame me. So it says, hey, they, they were to teach them a new set of language and, and literature and customs of the new culture to introduce them to the new idols of the day. And here's the thing. As long as you subscribe to false idols of the current culture, you are gonna find that your days are marked with instability. Because what you're gonna find is things are constantly shifting and a lot of these wonky ideas are fleeting. Which is why I say, hey, whoever marries the spirit of the age will eventually become a widow. I'm telling you, this stuff has a shelf life. But the king of kings and the Lord of lords, the, the, the source of all logic and reasoning and truth, the truth that has stood the test of time for centuries on end, for generation, for generation, is still the rock on which we stand and the firm foundation on which we build our lives. And I love speaking to antagonists. I love the person who just got the hard question. And I was talking to an individual recently, they're like, I just don't think the Bible's relevant. I said, okay, let's go there. You've either not done two things. You have either not read the times or you have not read the word. Because if you watch the five o'clock news and then open up your Bible, you're gonna assume it was written on Tuesday. And they, oh my goodness, this is living, active, sharper than a double-edged sword. It is relevant and applicable right here, right now. And the problem is, is there's such a increase in growing uh, pandemic of biblical illiteracy. Yes, I would put it in that category, that this is a growing problem. And the problem is you and I get our worldview from a word view. We view the world through the lens of scripture. 
We interpret life through the lens of God's truth. And when you don't understand or have a handle on God's word, you're gonna be topsy-turvy in this world full of turbulence. And if you look at individuals who work in the Justice Department of um, counterfeit money, I was reading this article recently and it was talking about the training of individuals who uh, specialize in identifying counterfeits and bringing justice to that situation. And it was talking about their training. And what surprised me was they almost spend no time studying, examining, and looking at phony uh, currency. They spend almost all their time studying the real thing. And because they spend so much time with the real thing, the moment they touch a fake, they know, now oh, this isn't real. I'm so familiar with the real thing, I can easily spot a fake thing. Tragically, too many Christians are falling for lies because they're not familiar with the truth. And it's just learning to say, hey, I need to be a better student, not to do God a favor, but to do myself a favor. And the moment I understand God's word, it will shape my life, his will, and his ways for me to live by. And there will be an attempt to tame you, to separate your worship from your convictions, to cause you to shrink back in your faithfulness and your devotion to God. And it's just learning to raise the awareness and to be mindful that if you're not careful, we will live every single day either forcefully being indoctrinated by things or just picking it up by osmosis. You just live in an environment long enough, it starts to seep into your mind and your heart. And if you're not diligent in relying on the word of God, it's gonna be hard, right? So there'll be an attempt to tame you. Lastly, the test to claim me. That at some point, the Babylonians, they looked at this group of people and they're like, we are taking them, we are claiming them as our own. And what I love about Daniel and the boys is they don't throw in the towel and they don't jump ship and they don't allow this wicked culture to claim their identity and their purpose. And it makes me think of all the things we say, things that I've said, so I'm guilty of this, where we say things, and it's not intended, but it, it's actually the wrong idea. I have said in sermons, hey, God is on your side, which I think there's truth in that, and there's some good to take from that. But a lot of times we can focus so much on God getting on our side, and we don't ever give any attention to the fact that maybe, just maybe, it shouldn't be him getting on our side, uh, but we should get in on his side. Folks, he is immovable. He is eternal. He is undefeated. He is all-powerful, all-knowing. Why wouldn't you wanna be on that side of history? And so a lot of times it is recognized there are gonna be things that claim you or try to claim your children. And it's saying, mm -mm, I'm devoting my life to Christ and I have been claimed, manufactured, and purchased by an incredible price. I'm with Christ. And, and just pay attention to the moments where you're in an environment that gets grabby on your purpose and your identity. And what is amazing to me is how Daniel's story ends, and, and I'm really just going to, to read you a passage and then we're gonna dismiss. Uh, because I, I think, again, it's not just the retelling of a story, it's the reliving of a story. Okay, so this guy was placed in this space. He somehow remained faithful. He stayed to the course, pressure came his way, adversity came his way. He kept his integrity intact. He maintained his relationship with God and somehow God extended favor to him and God extended more favor to him and he gained the trust of those around him because here's what's gonna happen. People in your space, they not, may not believe what you believe, but eventually they're gonna start to trust the way in which you behave. They're gonna start to realize, hmm, that one there is trustworthy. That one there has integrity. That one there cares about other people. That one there is not selfish and self-centered. That's the thing, as the people of God, we are losing our eccentricity. From the very beginning, the community of faith has been a very eccentric group of people. What's the word eccentric is made up of two Greek words, ek and kentron, ex and kentron. And the word means out, of center. And do you know when this word was popularized? 
when Copernicus walked outside and said, folks, I don't think the sun revolves around us. I think we revolve around the sun. We are out of the center of the universe. And one of the best things you can do for yourself is recognize, hey, just, just because you live in a world full of narcissism and self-centeredness, this doesn't revolve around you. And it doesn't revolve around me and it doesn't revolve around you and your kids. It revolves around God, the King of Kings. And when he is at the center, things make more sense and they just go better for you. And Daniel, he kept God at the center and God was faithful. He earned credibility. And what happens is, is multiple kings take reign of the Babylonians. And Daniel stays in position. And watch what happens in his career. And this is how he ends. So it pleased King Darius, who became king at the time, to appoint 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom with three administrators over them, one of whom was Daniel. And the satraps were made accountable to them so that the king might not suffer loss. And so think about it organizationally. Maybe some of you can uh, relate to this. There's 120, and then above those 120 are three direct reports to the king who oversee the others, okay? So it's now Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. And at this, the administrators and satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so, which just know this, sometimes people's criticism is the greatest form of affirmation. People criticize you when they're confident of your future. Right? The only people trying to hold you back are the ones who recognize you're passing them up. Can I get an amen? amen? Goes on to say they could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Again, he had character, which comes from his relationship with God and being anchored in those values and convictions. And finally, these men said, we will never find anything, uh, any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of his God. Which again, they will try to weaponize your faith. So these administrators and satraps went as a group to the king because when you lack credit, you need a lot of co-signers. So they went to the king and said, may the king live forever. And the royal administrators, prefects, satraps, advisors, and governors have all agreed, which <laughs> some of you need to hear this. Man's agreement does not determine God's assignment. Man's agreement just does not, yeah, come on, fella. Man's agreement does not determine God's assignment. You do not need the approval of man to live out the desires of God for your life. They all came in agreement that the king should issue an edict and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any God or human being during the next 30 days, except to you, your majesty, shall be thrown in the lion's den. Now, your majesty, issue the decree and put it in writing so that it cannot be altered. Someone say altered. And this is gonna be a theme that gets reinforced as we close. In accordance with the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be repealed. So King Darius put the decree in writing. Now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem and three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed giving thanks to his God just as he had done before. Here's the thing. You're gonna have to proactively choose how you're gonna act and honor God when pressure comes your way. Just choose now in advance. Hey, when pressure comes my way, I'm staying to the course. He hears, he learns that there's this decree. What does he do? I'm just gonna do what I've been doing. I'm gonna go home and pray. It says, then these men went as a group, which how many are there? Two administrators, 120 satraps, 122 of them outside hiding behind a bush and found Daniel praying and asking God for help. So they went to the king and spoke to him about his royal decree. And did you not publish a decree that during the next 30 days, anyone who prays 
to any God or human being except to you, your majesty, would be thrown in the lion's den? Because again, divisive people ask very obvious questions. And the king answered, the decree stands in accordance with the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be, say it with me, repealed. And they said to the king, Daniel, who is the one from the exiles from Judah? Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah. Know this, if people can't cast a shadow on your future, they will try to shine a light on your past. Daniel, I know you are really growing in confidence in Daniel, but remember, he's one of the exiles. Don't forget who he was. And he pays no attention to you, your majesty, or to the decree you put in writing. He still prays. And I pray that statement is true of you. No matter what you're going through, he still prays. She still prays. Three times a day. And when the king heard this, he was greatly distressed and he was determined to rescue Daniel and made every effort until sundown to save him. And then the men went as a group to the king, Darius, and said to him, remember your majesty, that according to the law of the Medes and Persians, no decree or edict that the king issues can be, say it with me, changed. So the king gave the order and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. And the king said to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve continually, rescue you. And a stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den, which Daniel is this beautiful foreshadow of Christ. The stone is rolled in front, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the rings of his nobles so that Daniel's situation, again, might not be changed. Then the king returned to his palace and spent the night without eating and without any entertainment being brought to him. And he could not sleep. And at first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. And when he came near the den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve continually been able to rescue you from the mouth of the lions? And Daniel answered, may the king live forever. My God sent his angel and he shut the mouths of the lion and they have not heard me because I was found innocent in his sight. Folks, God is paying attention. You don't just report to the department head or the business owner. No, the creator of the heavens and the earth, he's watching and he's aware and he's like, hey, I was found innocent in his sight, nor have I ever done any wrong before you, your majesty. And the king was overjoyed and gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. And when Daniel was lifted from the den, no wound was found on him because he trusted in his God. And this is where scripture gets uncomfortable. At the king's command, the men who had falsely accused Daniel were brought in and thrown into the lion's den along with their wives and children, and before they reached the floor of the den, the lions overpowered them. And it's wild, it's uncomfortable, but there comes a point where the lions on the inside devoured those lying on the outside. And crushed all their bones, and then King Darius wrote to all the nations and peoples of every language and all the earth, and check this out, May you prosper greatly. I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom, people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and he endures forever and his kingdom will never be destroyed and his dominion will never end. He rescues and he saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. And so Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus, the Persian. And here's the thing I would say to you, maybe just maybe, you're in a situation, you're facing hardships, you're facing pressure, and maybe just maybe your persecution is preparation for your promotion. I think Daniel's thrown into the lion's den and what happens is, is God strategically by his divine sovereignty positions him for promotion. He sets him apart. And I end with this. What was the thing that I was drawing your attention to? The fact that it couldn't be repealed. 
The decree couldn't be changed. It was sealed with the king's ring. And when King Darius looked at Daniel's situation, he saw a sealed fate. But when God looked at Daniel's situation, he saw a sign of faith. Oh, come on, somebody. He saw a sign of faith. And I think there are people in this world who they're gonna look at you living a life for Christ and the situation you're in, and they're going to misassume, oh, that's a sealed fate. They're doomed. But God looks at you and he sees a sign of faith. And the beautiful thing about faith is it's a two-way street. The same way your faith honors God, God honors your faith. And if you stand righteous and if you stand faithful and you stay to the course, anchored in your convictions, establishing your worship to give all glory to God and to work unto the Lord, I'm telling you, there comes a point where you discover goodness and mercy have followed me all the days of my life and my faithfulness has called his favor to gravitate upon me and maybe, just maybe, the pressure and the persecution just became preparation for your promotion. Stay to the core. Someone say, stay with it. Stay with it, amen.